I'm Tony Remus, and this is Tony Talks Back. I was very hesitant to create and release this episode. What I'm talking about today is bleak, to put it mildly. The bleakest outlook imaginable, as far as I can tell. Philosophical pessimism. The mere act of mentioning it and sharing the ideas with others is something that I'm very conflicted about. Because even if the outlook described by philosophical pessimism is a glimpse into the truth of the universe, it probably doesn't do anyone any good to have that view. Let me be clear. The views expressed by the following writers and thinkers are not necessarily views that I share. They were one part of my philosophical journey, and through the passage of pessimism, I think I gained useful wisdom. Do me a favor and don't listen to this episode halfway. If you start it, listen to the end. I mention the darkness, but also the light. Philosophical pessimism is a deeper kind of pessimism than what we normally use the word to mean. Those of you who have watched True Detective know the story of Rustin Cole, a tragic anti-hero working as a detective on dark, twisted, awful cases. Rust expressed philosophical pessimism as a guiding principle. I think human consciousness is a tragic misstep in evolution. We became too self-aware. Nature created an aspect of nature separate from itself. We are creatures that should not exist by natural law. What Rust stated there takes the Darwinian picture of biology and adds the mystery of human consciousness. In pure biological reality, life is a meat grinder. Nature is what selects by pitting life against other life. Trillions of creatures are created and die all the time often at the hands or sharp pointy apparatus of other creatures. In nature, there is no such thing as fairness, or mercy, or common decency. Even our domesticated pets will still eat your face off if and when you die and are no longer able to feed them. So in the light of this brutal horror of death and suffering beyond imagination, human consciousness arose. We don't know how exactly, and we don't know what consciousness is, as I've repeatedly said before. I've defined consciousness as subjective experience. There is something it's like to be me, and you. And we're aware of this fact in a self-reflective way. Likewise, we can reflect on matters of life, and death, and mortality. But most importantly, suffering. We are acutely aware of our own suffering, and Rust Cole believes life would be better if we weren't self-aware. If instead we were just meat that is animated for a brief period and then collapses again. It wasn't actually True Detective that introduced me to philosophical pessimism, but Thomas Ligotti and his book The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. I don't remember how I found the book, as it's pretty obscure, and for good reason. It expresses much of the same sentiments as Rust Cole. Ligotti begins his introduction with a quote from Julius Bonson, Man is a self-conscious nothing. Ligotti is himself a horror writer, and pretty very good at it. His genre is that of cosmic horror, of which H.P. Lovecraft and Cthulhu were the pioneers of. Lovecraft, in fact, expressed a certain amount of the pessimistic viewpoint. In The Call of Cthulhu, Lovecraft begins with these words. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality, and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation, or flee 
from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Lovecraft reinforced this idea later in that story with ideas of incomprehensible monsters existing in strange dimensions and realities that feel wrong. We have no idea how little we know of the world around us. This is the point of Bonson's quote, man is a self-conscious nothing. This is why Ligotti brings it up. We are aware of our own existence, and we are aware of our own ignorance. And that's terrifying, to have a sense of the size and scale of the universe, and our own place in it, is something that should never happen. But here we are. Ligotti's book focuses on the factors that have prevented this point of view from becoming mainstream. There are multiple pessimistic philosophers named and quoted to give a sense of the movement, but I won't get into that. Ligotti himself acknowledges it's more or less a self-defeating movement, but his action is done probably out of a desire to alleviate some of his angst around the topic. One can consider religion in the pessimistic context, but I don't think it does any good to alleviate the basic problem. If God exists, God is yet incomprehensible, and the horrifying nature of life may indicate that God is not, in fact, merciful. The classic problem of evil puts it like this. You can choose two of the following three characteristics. God is all-knowing, God is all-powerful, or God is all-loving. David Hume, a great Scottish philosopher, found problems with combining all three. If God knows about evil and loves us, why does he not stop it? There are slippery ways out of the question, like God gave us free will, or what have you. The problem remains, though, why would God create beings in the first place that he or she or it knows are only ever going to experience suffering, possibly for eternity? Why not leave us in non-existence? And this solution is the pessimistic goal, non-existence. Varieties of pessimism will either claim that all life should cease immediately that all self-conscious life should cease immediately, or that all life should stop reproducing and creating more life. Regardless of which flavor is chosen, a society that values its own existence and has tools at its disposal such as the nuclear bomb should never ever ever allow pessimism to come to power. Even well-regarded academic pessimists are intense in their claims. Professor David Benatar is the head of philosophy at the University of Cape Town. Benatar had a very interesting discussion with Dr. Jordan Peterson, a clinical psychologist and teacher currently at the University of Toronto. The debate is well worth a listen. Benatar takes an antinatalist view of life. That is, Benatar assigns a negative value to birth, which is natalism. It is wrong, in Benatar's estimation, to grab a soul out of non-existence and force them into this world to toil and suffer without consent. Peterson debates the framework which Benatar lays out his argument in, and there are various examples that may or may not hit the mark. Peterson's ultimate claim is that life isn't only suffering, it's an opportunity of potential. One can make their life out to be only suffering, and thereby increase suffering even more. Or one can mitigate that suffering to the best of their ability, and perhaps improve the world ever so slightly. Benatar's opposition to that is that we don't have the right to force people to work to create from literal non-existence beings that suffer and perish due to our actions. What is the truth? Who is right? I'm still not sure.
It's very easy to get caught up in the pessimistic pattern of thinking once you've learned it. The truths expressed are simple and axiomatic. Life is suffering. Self-awareness of that suffering makes it even worse. We should end self-awareness. If you're not familiar with Buddhism, at first thought, you might not think Buddhism to have anything at all in common with philosophical pessimism. My own conception of Buddhism for a very long time was as a sort of monkish passivity, the smiling Buddha, unwilling or unable to take life seriously. I can't really blame myself for being so ignorant. There aren't a lot of Buddhist temples in the rural Midwest. I came to understand, though, through reading about Buddhism and engaging with such ideas throughout college, that Buddhism is profoundly philosophical. In Thomas Ligotti's Conspiracy Against the Human Race, before the introduction, the book opens first with an epigraph from the Dhammapada, one of the central collections of teachings from Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. Look at your body, a painted puppet, a poor toy, of jointed parts ready to collapse, a diseased and suffering thing with a head full of false imaginings. It's true, isn't it? Our bodies begin to decay from the moment we enter the world. One of the Buddha's central teachings is that of the four noble truths, the very first of which is that life is suffering. We observe this every waking moment, though we can choose to not pay attention to it. Ourselves, and everyone we know, and everything we see, will decay and disappear. The teachings of the Buddha are often understood as not to be taken as objects of belief, but as verifiable statements through our own experience. The truth of suffering is apparent in all that we do. In this way, Buddhism is more so a philosophy than a religion, although many cultures and varieties exist. But the real kicker, one that I think speaks to why I don't personally follow philosophical pessimism, is the second noble truth, that desire is what causes suffering. This is a strange formulation when considering that pain is a reality most often caused by something physical. We might stub our toe or suffer the sudden loss of a friend, but the idea is that suffering as a concept only exists because we have a desire to end our suffering. If we didn't have that desire, then suffering would simply be. No contrast class would exist. This is the third noble truth. Cessation of desire is the cessation of suffering. The fourth noble truth is that the way to end our desire is through the Eightfold Path, a set of guidelines governing thought and action. The path is much more complicated than I can do justice to here. So I want to focus on the relation between these concepts in Buddhism and philosophical pessimism. Pessimism takes the emergence of self-consciousness to be something inherently bad, or at least something that shouldn't exist. Why shouldn't it exist? I think that's a fair question considering the seriousness of the topic at hand. Because life is suffering, is the first answer. But that doesn't appear to me to be good enough. Why should life be anything besides suffering? Is suffering inherently bad? One could say, yes, obviously, suffering is bad. And I don't want to mitigate the absolute horrors that occurred in Auschwitz and Dachau, so I would like to contrast the ideas of necessary suffering versus unnecessary suffering. Life is suffering. True. Life doesn't have to be all suffering, also true. There's an interpretation of Buddhism in which the ultimate aim is to achieve a state of nothingness, no self. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't exist in the world. You've only seen that there's a deeper truth to everything, and you've let go of, say, the necessity of being. But you're still here. Someone who's attained that view 
doesn't magically vanish into thin air, at least as far as I know. There's no reason to assume that one couldn't carry on living. Building a home, a family, being a beneficial member of society, while maintaining their state of nothingness, no self. I'm sorry, I'm really, really sorry if that doesn't make any sense. I have been puzzling about it for so long now, but not nearly as long as some others. Now, the distinction between necessary and unnecessary suffering. Going back to Dr. Jordan Peterson, perhaps while we are here in this life, we should eliminate as much as we can the unnecessary burdens of life for the sake of those around us. We can recognize and eliminate desire in ourselves while striving to create conditions that make it easier for everyone to do the same. I think it's evident that the Buddhist view spreads much more easily in modern life than in a hellish German concentration camp. Maybe this is also a desire of that to spread the word, so to speak. The Buddha himself, the enlightened one, is said to have chosen this path. The Buddha was not satisfied with enlightenment unless all beings had also attained it. Try to take seriously Jordan Peterson's argument in that context, that to strive against suffering may be that which can justify suffering to begin with, or at least strive to justify your life in the face of its suffering. To close this episode, I'll bring up a relevant view from Dr. Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps and a practicing psychiatrist at the time of his internment. He details some of his experience with the darkest aspect of humanity in Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl suggests that suffering in and of itself is absolutely meaningless, that it is instead our reaction to suffering which creates our meaning. This is demonstrated by the numerous games and tricks Nazi guards would play on the prisoners, the absolutely degrading working conditions, the ridicule and slander the prisoners were constantly subjected to for no reason at all. The only goal of such endeavors, besides the amusement of the guards, was the wanton increase in abject human suffering that they caused. Why would anyone place meaning in something so arbitrary? Instead, our own reactions to the suffering we experience can create a moment in time that nothing can take away, where we say to the universe, I am here. Perhaps when faced with unbearable suffering, it is only proper to stand up in the face of it and bear it until we are dust and bones. Does this justify existence? Can we say that bringing new life into this world is a moral good, or at least not a moral bad, when that life has the unique opportunity to bear suffering and therefore create meaning? You'll have to decide that on your own. This has been Tony Talks Back. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. Hey friends, hope you enjoyed the episode. Feel free to leave a comment or review wherever you're listening. I'd love to hear from you on social media or elsewhere. Hit me with your best shot.